Hi, Florence Theriault here again and showing you some more wonderful half dolls and half doll related items from the Hanna Butkus collection of Vienna, Austria. Uh, this is an extraordinary collection. We've titled our catalog Lady Fancies because we think this is the type of thing that women had on their, in their boudoirs, on the dressing tables, in the tea tables in the early 1900s and very popular trend that transversed from Europe to the United States to the entire world. Last weekend, uh, someone said, oh, Florence, did you watch the football game? You know, football season started. And I said, oh, well, that's, that's lovely. Um, like I've never seen a football game in my life and I kind of made that clear to them and I really don't care. And then they looked at me and they said, and it struck a light with me, you know, if you learned more about the game, you might enjoy it because it's all about the plays, the rules, the little finessing, the nuances. And I thought, that's kind of like half dolls because I was preparing for this talk. So I decided that's what I would like to do with you today is to show you, instead of just thinking, oh, half dolls, I don't know if I collect half dolls, I wanted to show you some of the reasons that you could look at them with a different eye and see all of the variations of them and the the different ways that they were part of society as a whole at that time. So I wanted to start by showing you this girl I'm holding in my hand. And this is a, a lovely doll uh, that was done, actually a shoulder head doll that was done as part of the Bavarian Art Guild movement in the, uh, about 1910. Now, antique doll collectors know that the art movement in um, Bavaria introduced dolls like the Marion Collitz dolls, the Cameron Reinhardt art character reform dolls, but they really don't realize that it mostly began with these porcelain dolls that were done as highly stylized ladies and were transformed into tea cozies, boudoir dressing dolls, and the like. And this is a very rare early example of one with her original porcelain arms, her original uh, tea cozy base, and her wonderful fashionable costume of the period. So moving on from there, let me show you a few more. It was very interesting to me, again, trying to think over details of the whole concept that it seemed like half dolls in their representation of mostly women went from 18th century women to Art Deco, very avant 20th century women, 1920s, 1930s of the flapper era with not a whole lot in between. And I, I find that really curious, but, so I wanted to show you some of them. Now on the front here, I have put three dolls and this is what I wanted to say. I kept thinking, I, I guess I keep making these allusions to all sorts of other things, but I kept thinking of that Judy Collins song, all, both sides now. But I think about half dolls, all sides now. People tend to see a photograph of a half doll and they'll see the front face. And that's if you go into a, a sales room or a showroom or look at a collector's doll, you'll see the front face. What you make a mistake is not seeing the piece entirely turned around. First, I'm going to show all three of these turned to the side. Oh, maybe I can just do it like that. Okay, so you can see a side angle of them, completely different. And then let me turn them to the back, and it's really stunning. Now, half doll collectors know, but if you're, if you're new to the field, you may not realize these were not one pieces of mold. These were done in several pieces. The arms were modeled separately. Very often the, the hair coming out the back was modeled separately. And the pieces were then um, put together and then finally fired in a kiln with the final porcelain decoration on them. But do you realize with all of that putting things together, piecing things, how fragile, how delicate these pieces were and how careful these craftsmen must have been that worked on these pieces. Look at her extended arm. One little finger, they would have had to throw it in the trash, but so they were very, very careful. And then of course, the artistry of painting them. So we're seeing here three wonderful dolls representing 18th century women. And her, this one in particular was really shocking to me because when I first saw the front, I thought, oh wow, she has that really, um, 
high Marie Antoinette court style hair. And then when I turned it around, it's all that detail in the back. I thought, this is extraordinary. What you're going to find in these 18th century dolls, by the way, you find a lot of them nude, not because they were doing nudity, but because the notion was that they would be dressed as they were assembled with either a dresser box or um, a tea cozy or some other type of, of object. That, of course, is why they have the sew holes at the bottom, these little holes, so they could be attached to their pin cushion or other base. Um, one of the things I, I think that is really interesting are look for little subtleties of detail. For example, this girl in the middle, at the top of her head, where the feather is, there is a drilled hole. And that hole was designed so that you could place an actual feather in that hole. So you brought a more of a real textural um, concept to the presentation of the doll. You'll find the same kind of themes appearing over and over in these 18th century, made about 1910, but representing 18th century women. You'll find them holding letters, love letters. You'll find them holding flowers. They're very dainty, feminine uh, type of things. And you're going to find this is a total change when you get up to the flapper ladies, so keep this in mind. Other examples from that time period, I wanted to show you, for example, this is what the notion was. If you look at this doll, see how her overskirt Underneath that, she had the little um, base, porcelain base coming down with the sew holes, but how that would fit onto, in this case, a firm base with soft around here to be designed as a pin cushion, and then a fabric skirt done. Now, very often designed that you could go into a gift shop and you could buy it fully assembled with the beautiful work done by the atelier of that gift shop, or more often, the costuming was done by the ladies in there little sewing salons that they would have at home, and it was a popular pastime of the time period. We have this particular one I wanted to show you because she is holding um, the tea set, which is a, was a very popular idea of producing a half doll holding a tray of cocoa or tea, and a lot of it was inspired by a very famous painting that was done at the time, um, which showed what we refer to today as the Baker's Cocoa Lady. And I'll be showing you another example of that. I wanted to show you this one because I thought she had, and again, turning around, you see her from the front, looks like she has a very simple turban over her head. When you turn her around, you're going to see the design on the turban, which is a very um, delightful, charming little polka dot design, and then how it is drawn back at the back into um, like a little bow or flounce, as you might call it, very neatly neatly done. And a wonderful pose of her face, slightly tilted to the side, eyes downcast. You look at all of these type of things when you're looking at half doll. We have in the middle an 18th century lady, certainly of the court, and again, holding a letter in her hand. Could be a decree, could be a love letter. One of the things I found out when I was cataloging all these dolls, I found myself wanting to make little stories about all of them because, and I think, and then I started to think, oh, I don't think it's just me. I think it's the way they were designed originally. They were like little, you, they were designed to pique your imagination and to get you to think of them in terms of perhaps telling some kind of a story. And let me show her to you this way. And then this way. So you don't only look, just to keep repeating myself, you don't only look at half dolls from the front. You look at the sides, you look at the back, because the detailing and the modeling of them continues all the way around. In the front, we have another lovely lady and looks fairly simple, although quite delightful from the front. Her arms are extended, so remember, always done in different molds and then assembled. But when we turn her around, look at that bonnet. The streamers continue, they're all wrapped around and they cascade down her back. Very, very beautifully done. I had to leave this lovely little girl to show almost by herself apart from the others because, she, because there's something about her that's extremely rare other than her style and that is her size. Very, very large size, anything over five inches in half doll world is considered very rare, certainly much more luxurious at the time, and very, very few of them are found today. And I want to show her all the way around so you can see her. Ribbons dangling onto her shoulders, and the one, two, three, looks like six plumes, six feathered plumes in her bonnet. 
very, very stylized and quite a generously buxom lady here. Very fit, very beautiful doll. Now, what I want to show you here are, as the manufacturers were working, and a lot of collectors like to make this their angle of collecting, they realized that not everyone liked the same colors. Or the doll was going to be made into a, a tea cozy or a salon doll with a powder box, that people had different color schemes in their homes. So they would present the same doll with different color variations. And I have a couple examples to show you. Here we have the same model with variations in the bodice. Now, sometimes the variations would extend only to colors, and other times there would be a variation in um, what they might be holding. One might be holding a letter, one might be holding a flower. And they could do that because, again, repeating to you, these were not, um, these were not one-piece molds. They were pieces that were put on. These two little children are a wonderful example um, one number they vary in number one, one is larger than the other. Number two, the color of their costumes. One has the delicate uh, grays with, I think it's a little pale blue trim on it. And the other has the green bonnet with the blue bodice and different variations in the accent pieces. So you could, they were avail, uh, available not only in different colors, but in many, many different sizes. And then I had one other example to show you. This one is really um, variegated. And here we have this lovely lady, the very same model. I hope I have them posed exactly like so you can see that. And there's just so many different variations. Uh, this one is a high concentration of gilt accent on the pieces. They both have dre the Dresden type flowers and all of these, you're going to see more of these in a minute, all of these wonderful flowers were applied to these dolls petal by petal by petal. It's such an extraordinary amount of work. I don't think anything that anyone would accomplish today except perhaps an artisan working out of their own studios. And then we can turn them around. And again you can see how the detail continues onto the back side. So you chose which one would fit most with your environment. 